In depth this Friday, it's the number one killer in the U.S., but now there's a new groundbreaking treatment that could save the lives of patients suffering from cardiovascular disease. Dr. Randy Shuck has more details. Joining me now is Dr. Jonathan Fong. Dr. Fong is a cardiovascular surgeon, so thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. First question, of course, is what's the difference between a cardiologist and a cardiovascular surgeon? Typically, a cardiologist is the person that diagnoses your problem, and the cardiac surgeon is the one that fixes the problem. Uh, there is a transition uh, in that ability in the sense that the cardiologists now have the ability through catheter-based techniques to uh, place stents, even the possibility of placing valves um, or fixing other valvular problems. Um, but in, in general, cardiac surgeons receive the referral from the cardiologist when, there's, when they are unable to enact or repair. So really you're the end game and then we're looking at all this stuff. But today we're going to talk about prevention. So why would a cardiovascular surgeon who needs this in order to work want to prevent the disease altogether? Well I think that we as physicians are interested in putting ourselves out of business actually. Mm -hmm. uh, if we do our jobs perfectly well we think that we might be able to do that. Um, after the scourge of cardiovascular disease has been with us for the last half century, maybe even a full century, uh, we recognize that there are other factors that go into it besides what we can do uh, with the technologies available to us. So we're interested in making sure that you stay as healthy as possible for as long as possible, understanding that there are factors in terms of genetics, in terms of family history, that may lead you to surgery anyway. So and being a part of that team earlier on probably will make it so that that's done at the appropriate time as opposed to last ditch. Absolutely. All right, so we know that cardiovascular disease is bad. We've known this for a long time. Still the number one killer of people with all this technology. What are we missing? Why are we not getting better at this? Well, I think uh, a little bit is human nature. Mm -hmm. I think people still want to do what they want to do. Um, I think that there are genetic factors I referred to before that we don't completely understand yet. Uh, I think that the Human Genome Project is getting down the road with identifying the, the genes that are going to help us uh, towards gene therapy in the future. Uh, whether that happens in our lifetime or not, we'd like to believe that it will, um, but uh, unclear to us whether it will at this point. Uh, I think that um, the issues with uh, what you can do with your own preventative uh, factors is really left up to you. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to control your blood pressure, control your diabetes, control your cholesterol, change your eating habits, get some exercise? I think that those are uh, factors that some people desire to do mm -hmm. and there are other people who need to come face to face with someone like me before they're willing to do that. Interestingly enough, I have a patient who um, has severe valvular disease. Um, she was a very, very sedentary individual and what I discovered is when presented with the option of surgery versus see if I can get myself in better shape, understand that she's going to need surgery anyway. Mm -hmm. She altered her lifestyle, was willing to lose 40 pounds at the last time I checked with her and has really gotten done quite a good job in terms of preparing herself for what we would consider to be corrective surgery, but some people might interpret that as preventative surgery in the sense that she wouldn't have to suffer the ravages of the disease going forward. Sure. Well, let's talk about the, the techniques real quick because you know, you've been in practice for a little bit of time. We've known cardiovascular disease, but you said that statistically things have changed dramatically since you started versus now. Tell me a little bit about you know, the issues of, that you had before and how we're doing so much better in the surgery portions of it. I think that uh, technology continues to progress scientific investigation and inquiry continue to progress. We understand the physiology better. We understand the technology a bit better. Uh, we understand miniaturization. Uh, things that we, that even in the 20 years that I've been in practice, I think we've gone from understanding uh, how we can do an open repair of an aneurysm versus now having a, what we call a stented graft mm -hmm. that can be inserted through a groin artery uh, that has revolutionized um, aneurysm care and mm -hmm. treatment. Similarly, we, when I began, we did not have um, a specific pacemaker device called a biventricular AICD. We had pacemakers, we had AICDs, which is an automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Mm -hmm. but, um, the idea that you could actually synchronize or resynchronize the left ventricle and the right ventricle so that they would function better and uh, alleviate congestive heart failure 
uh, is completely new in probably the last 10 years and, and really has altered the landscape in terms of what we can apply to patients. So that seems like a reasonable place to do a little bit earlier than we were waiting before. So how much exercise diet issues is really important? We saw a show last night on another station that was talking about fit and fat. Do you agree with that? I think that there are individuals, uh, you can look at um, in the sports arena when you have a, a 280 pound lineman who can chase down uh, mm -hmm. a five foot six running back from behind now running a four or five forty. Uh, you have sumo wrestlers who eat calories the way Michael Phelps eats them yet mm -hmm. are very nimble, very flexible and demonstrate that they are still fit athletes and yet you have some people that look like you or I who are out of breath when they go up a flight of stairs. Whether that's from the ravages of smoking, whether that's uh, poor diet, uh, we don't really know, but clearly exercise does does help. And the, the diet portion of it is the cholesterol, all the different pieces we've heard, uh, heard every day, this is good for you, now this is not good for you. This is a thing, now we can't eat that anymore. Any ideas or any anything out there you wanna say that take as like the gospel? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's a very difficult answer. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that from my standpoint, I think you have to know yourself. You have to know your own history. Mm -hmm. I think that for certain individuals of different ethnic backgrounds, some who come from the Mediterranean area may have uh, genetics that uh, are actually protective. And uh, we know that there are uh, entire villages who have enormously elevated uh, cholesterol levels, but yet are, have no evidence of cardiovascular disease. And I know there are ongoing studies to look at that to see if that is applicable to a broader population. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know for a fact that there is a, a, a specific individualized answer yet. I know that that's where medicine is moving to understand your genome, mm -hmm. to be able to um, be very patient specific in terms of how you uh, apply the technology. Sure, but makes sense. The idea behind all of that is uh, there's no one set. There's not one exercise plan, there's not one food plan, there's not one medicine plan. Working with all the physicians, cardiovascular, cardiologists, primary, should hopefully get all of us in the right position so we're all thinking the right way so it's a, not a one fit issue. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's glad to be here. Mm -hmm. Doctors say that family history and lifestyle choices are the huge risk factors for heart disease. They recommend patients eat healthy, exercise, and also never smoke. And that's it for today's In-Depth. As always, you can catch this and past In-Depth segments on demand. That's channel 999.